right now. We're going to come back to it. But I feel like we're going to move on into preaching. God's going to speak to somebody. And we'll come back to this place. Praise God. Praise God. As you return to your seats, why don't you shake somebody's hand? absence of pastor, he's preaching Mississippi, I believe, I appreciate his trust to fill this position tonight thank you for coming to have church amen great people of God, to all of our guests we're so glad that you're here, thank you for being a part of Cornerstone Revival Center tonight praise God Your Bibles. John chapter 13, start at verse 34. Hallelujah. Thankful for the word Bishop preached to us this morning. I want to watch him pray slack in this time of distractions. I'm thankful for our pastor, our leadership, the direction that it feels like this church is moving into great, large things, big things, deep waters. Amen. John 13, verse 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Everybody says, I want to be a disciple. That's only if you have love one to another. 1 John 3, 10 through 12. While you turn to that, or punch it in on your phone. We'll have announcements at the end of service. Take offering. Is the are the Bible quiz booths sign up still out there? Yeah. So if you miss announcements after service, don't forget on your way out to sign up for Bible quizzing if you want to help, or if your kids want a Bible quiz, be a part of something great. It's a new happening thing. Praise God. First John three ten through twelve says. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. This is the message that you heard from the beginning, love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Once you lay your Bibles down, lift your hands, help me pray. In the name of Jesus, God, we want you to have your way in this service right now. God, have full course in it. Let your word find its mark. In the name of Jesus, help us tonight, God. Let your word forever change us to be more like you. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Why don't you clap your hands one more time as you're seated. Great singing tonight, Brother Will. We are blessed with talent in this church and thankful for it. Amen. Genesis 4, 8 through 11 records the story of Cain and Abel. The Bible says that Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? God said to him, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened health to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. That makes for a great Sunday school lesson. 
Cain and Abel. In the process of time, they're to bring their sacrifice, to roll their sins ahead. And it says that Cain brought from the fruit of the ground. Abel brought a sheep. And we know how we teach it in Sunday school. It's a good time. We'll stack up some fruit and we'll have a little depiction. They'll color in a little sheep and an altar. And the point of the story is that God doesn't accept Cain's sacrifice. Why? Because Cain tried to do things his own way. When we come into the presence of God or to be acceptable, righteous to God, we're going to do it on God's terms. You can do that by the word of God. And so even today, people are still coming on their own terms, and they will find out that they are not accepted, they're not righteous concerning God and where they stand with him. But despite what went on prior to the story of Cain and Abel, that's not the scope of what I want to preach about tonight. Uh, what I'm more interested in is what was going through Cain's mind, what we would call the spirit of Cain, that would lead him up to the place to where he would be standing in the field. We know this would have been Abel's place of work. And they're in the field, and Abel was working, and, and Cain would get so angry with him that not only would he commit the first murder, but when God asked him about it, he would be to that point to where he says, am I my brother's keeper? He's just killed his brother. I can't imagine killing anybody, especially not my brother. And so when God comes to talk to me about it, that spirit that's taken over Cain, that mindset, that, that baffles me. That's almost hard to imagine that a man would stand there and say, am I my brother's keeper? What is it to me? I'm not interested in him. What a narcissistic, egotistical, vain, self-centered mindset Cain must have had. Am I my brother's keeper? Is it my problem? You see, in today's world, the spirit of Cain still runs rampant. That spirit that says, I don't have to worry about anybody else. That spirit that says, I'm not worried if I damage them or talk about them or slander them, if I hurt them, trash them, abuse them, or even go as far as killing them, I don't really care. I don't care if it hurts their feelings. It's all about me. And, and, and part of that is, is influenced and increased because we have TikTokers and, and newscasts and job promotions that depend on trampling on somebody else. Our world creates an environment that makes that okay, that that's the only way I can get to the top is if I push them out of the way and if I push them off to the side and I'm not concerned. And see, even here preaching tonight, a message with the title that you've heard this from the beginning. You can sit here so unmoved. And I'm not chiding with you. That is just the, the place that we get. But when you look at the Word of God, love is what everything's built upon. Love is everything that we see happen in the Gospels. Love is everything that I see happen in the book of Acts. It's because he first loved me. Yet we walk around making celebrities out of people that trash and hurt and injure and make fun of and cut down and embarrass their brother or their sister. You say, well, that's not in the church. Yes, it is. It was in the first church. John dealt with it. Paul dealt with it. And the Holy Ghost would lead me to preach about it tonight. John the Apostle, the writer of 1 John, 2, 3 John, the writer of the Gospel of John, was the last of the surviving apostles. Feeble, aged, living in Ephesus, he would have been in his 80s or 90s at the writing of the epistle. Over 60 years prior to that writing, he would have spent three years with Jesus Christ. 
One of the first called at the boat when Jesus says, come with me and I'll make you fishers of men. One of the first that would have been privately taught by Jesus, the Apostle John. One that was there during every miracle. One that was there in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. One that received the Holy Ghost, evidence in speaking of other tongues. One that stood with the 11 with Peter as he preached on the day of Pentecost. The Apostle John. He saw salvation come to the Jews, to the Greeks, to the Gentiles. He was a part of it all. He was even there at the cross as Jesus hung there for you and me. And he said, we heard him, we saw him with our eyes, and we touched him with our hands. The word of life. He qualifies what he's writing about by saying, you know what, I was there. It may have been 60 years ago, but I was there. I saw what he went through. I saw what he did. That was God in the flesh. That was the word of life. That was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And so for John to write so intricately and delicately in the Gospels and in his epistle about the love of God, there was a revelation in that man that took place because something Jesus put inside of him that changed him despite what he went through and despite the things that he faced and despite how he was treated. When you start reading the epistle of John, it is love your brother, love them. If you know God, you have love. If you don't know God, you won't have love and vice versa. It was absolutely emphatically put into every writing that he had, you have to love your brother because God first loved you. And if you have the love of God inside of you as you claim that you do, because you see, in that day when he's writing to the churches, because the, the, the epistle, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, not being addressed to a church, was addressed to believers. It was addressed to people like you and me. And he was facing things. He was dealing with things in the church strife and envying and struggles, fractured, breaking of unity, and he understood that if they can't love each other, despite where they've come from, despite what their background is, whether they were raised in church or just walked into the church on a Sunday night, whether they were white, black, Asian, Hispanic, if they can't love each other as their brother, if I can't convey that to them, then there's going to be a problem. There's going to be fractures. The church can't go on like it's supposed to go. And so that all starts with looking at the spirit of Cain. The spirit of Cain is still thriving in the earth today. It's one that says, get out of my way. I've got things to do. It's one that says, my life's more important. I've got things that I'm more concerned with than a lost and dying world. It's one that says, I'm not interested in revival because I've got a nine-to-five job to take care of. Or one that says, I'm not interested in helping out my neighbor because I've got some other things going on right now that are a little bit more important. It's that spirit of Cain that wants to rise up and segregate and separate us. Are you going to help me preach tonight? There's a scientific article that was written in 1986 by the JAMA. It's the Journal of the American Medical Association. This article is titled, On the Physical Death of Jesus Christ. In it, the authors prove that the Roman flogging process was horribly cruel. This is graphic. Technical details are outlined, which along with the biblical narrative provide a comprehensive overview of the entire process of the trial and death of Jesus on the cross. Before judgment, it's narrated in Luke 22 that Jesus was in deep distress. The Bible records sweating of blood. Although this is very rare, doctors recognize this feature as hematidrosis, which can cause or be caused by high levels of stress. Has anybody ever sweated blood before? We think that we're stressed. 
We think that we've got too much on our shoulders. When's the last time you were so stressed that you sweated blood? After being judged, Jesus was violently whipped with a leather whip with tiny balls of iron on the tips and pointed bones. The balls of iron caused internal injuries and the bones tore apart the flesh. This would have exposed skeletal muscles and major blood loss. It would have left him in a state borderline dead. And after this severe flogging, Jesus was mocked, spat up on, forced to carry his own cross to Golgotha. During the crucifixion, he was thrown onto a cross laying on the ground and with 18 inch long nails driven through his feet and through his wrist. Crucifixion was a process that not only induced intense pain, but caused a slow, suffocating death. Breathing would have been extremely painful because as those nails were pierced through his feet and his arms hanging out beside him, the only way to get a breath as he slumped down would be to push against those nails and his feet would tear and his bones would break. And his back that's torn and ripped and slashed, dragging against that wooden cross as he slides up and down for every agonizing, painful breath that he could take. When the Gospel of John narrates that after Jesus' death, the soldier pierced him with the spear and out came blood and water. Scientists' explanation of this is represented by the pleural fluid and the pericardium that would have preceded the blood flow would have been less than the volume of blood. But because of this scenario of possible acute heart failure and unable to be able to breathe, the volume of that water would have been increased dramatically. And only by analyzing Jesus' physical suffering do we realize how terrible it must have been to endure all of this. Intense stress, a sleepless night, an unfair judgment, mocked, slashed, and being forced to carry his own instrument of death. But even more than that, you say, how could there be any more than that, Brother Brantley? I'm not sure that there's a single person here that could endure that. I don't know if I could. But even after all of that, there's a prophecy from Isaiah. But he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement that brings peace was on him. And by his stripes we were healed. You see, he didn't just bear that physically. There was something spiritual taking place right there. And when we say every sin, we say it so unemotionally. But understanding that he was God in flesh and he knew no sin. He was sinless. What the sins of the world must have been like as they laid down upon him that night and that day. must have been overbearing. Brother Sean Ryan, as he thought about you and he thought about me, and everybody else sends sin to God, but you and I have a similar past to get us to this point today, preachers of the gospel, to know the things that I did in the world and the place that he brought me out of. And there's testimony after testimony in here 
your sins. Not just the sins of the world. That's too broad. Anna Cluxton's sins. Ronnie Miller's sins. Cletus Fitzgerald's sins. My sins. And he would say, if it be thy will, let this cup pass me by. Because in his flesh and in his spirit, he was taking a beating like nobody's ever taken before. And he didn't deserve it. It wasn't his to bear. It was mine. I should have been the one that was hanging on that cross. I should have been the one that was bearing it. You mean you're going to come in here and preach like this on a Sunday night? Sunday nights are when we huck and buck and swing from the chandeliers. This is a message from the beginning. Because you see, in Genesis, Cain didn't kill Abel until chapter 4. But in chapter 3, God said, I've got a plan. I'm going to show you what love looks like. Because despite the fact that you fell into sin, despite the fact that you disobeyed me, despite the fact that I made everything perfect for you, the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head. That cross is going to represent something of love because you may have not loved me but I loved you and I had a plan for you I didn't want to see you fallen I didn't want to see you away from me I didn't want to see you separated from me I didn't want to see you go into where you were supposed to go go into where it was designed for you to be because of sin, there was a, slam, a, a lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. He had a plan for you, Christian McDaniels. He loved you. He loved you with a love that can't be explained. He loved you with a love that can't be bought. It can't be encouraged. It is a never-ending unadulterated, perfect love. It's a love that passes what we can understand because in our human state, we can't do that on our own. It's not in me to love like he loved. We inherit our Adamic nature Psalms 51 says, in sin did my mother conceive me. It doesn't mean she was sinful while at conception. But rather there's a bloodline from Adam that's passed down to Cain, to Abel, to Seth, and on and on and on and still being passed down to man today. A bloodline that's still in it has the ability to be just like Cain, to be self-centered. A bloodline that, that is it by nature self-sacrificing? Is it by nature willing to put itself out there and care about somebody else to the point to where you would sacrifice your life 
But Jesus would do that for me. You may think life's bad. You may think that you're going through some things. You may think that you're in the middle of something that you can't come out of. You may think that there are things going on in your life and God's not interested in you anymore. Let me tell you something. There is a love that passes anything that you think. There's a love that can come into your life that can change everything that you are and everything that you've been. There's a love that's in this room right now that if God ever gets a hold of you and you ever get that love inside of you, it will change your outcome. It will change your direction. It will create revival in you. It will bring things to life in you that have been dead for so long. It will make an impact in your world that you've never seen before. It comes when you get the Spirit of God in you. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth not God. He that loveth knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that, he might, that we might live through him. Here in his love, this is written by the same writer that we took our text from. He's talking about a message from the beginning. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. There's got to be something that changes inside of you. Romans 12 talks about a transforming of my mind, a transforming of the way that I think. Will you put Acts chapter 3? It looks like this. It looks like, you see, when, when, when we get the Holy Ghost, we understand that is God filling us with his spirit. And when that happens, it's because I've repented of my sins. I haven't just said, God, I'm sorry of that, but God, I'm repenting of those sins. God, I'm turning away from that. Whatever it is, it could be something as small as, as telling lies to something as, as bad as you've murdered somebody, and you can fill in the blanks in between. But it's, God, I've made up my mind. I am repenting of that right now. And that repentance looks like a turning away and a walking away from that. I'm not going to stay in that. I'm not just sorry because the preacher preached me under condemnation tonight. But I'm making up my mind. I'm turning around and walking away back from that sin, and I'm not ever going back to it again. And so when God fills you with his spirit, go to put Galatians 5. 22, up there first. When God fills you with his spirit, there is something that changes inside of us. And you see that the design of the way God works in us is for something to begin to grow in us. I'm not going to be the same that I was. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Go back one verse. But the very first thing that's supposed to start growing in you is what? It's love. When you become one of his, and see, we can't have this kind of love without having the Spirit of God inside of us. It doesn't work that way. And that was a race to the front on both sides. Praise God. We can't have that type of love in us without first getting the Spirit of God. There is nothing in this world, and there is nothing in me, and there is nothing in my nature that lets me love like the fruit of the Spirit is talking about right there. It's just not going to happen. Now, yes, you can love your brother and be completely in the world, and you can care about somebody, but there is something different about the love of God. And the apostle, the writer of John in 1 John compares those together. He combines those. It's an agape type of love. And we can see that worked out. 
There's many examples of it in the, uh, in the scripture. Come here, brother. Actually, I'll tell you what. Y'all stand up. Y'all are big guys. Acts chapter 3. Just, just these guys. There's a lame man. You're lame. You can't walk. Sit down. There's people that carry him to the gate called beautiful. Pick him up. Carry him to the gate over here. You're lame. Don't walk. I wouldn't be preaching if I didn't have some type of object lesson. Lay him down. Y'all can sit down. Y'all just drop him off the gate. After that, nobody's interested in what happens to the lame man. They just put him there every day, and then he's in the way, so they move him. You can kind of drag yourself over and sit up a little bit. I don't know if he completely laid down like that. Yeah, that's better. Good. Acts chapter 3. The Holy Ghost has been poured out. These men are full of the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that Peter and John are going to the temple. And they're coming up to the gate that's called Beautiful. And a certain lame man, his whole life, they laid him daily at the gate. Ask for alms. 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 There you go. He asked for alms. Better get that out of there before you think the offerings are your alms. <laughs> I'll be in trouble. That's the last time I get to preach. So Peter and John are going to the gate. Let me. I'm trying. I'm trying to give you a perfect illustration of how God's love looks. Because that's me, and that's you. He saw Peter and John, and he asked him for alms. Next verse. Peter, fastening his eyes up on him with John. John and Peter are walking by, asked for alms. He gets their attention. They both look at him. He's wanting silver and gold, but Peter says, you know what? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Don't get up yet. Peter, being full of the Holy Ghost, exercising the fruit of the Spirit, is demonstrating what love looks like. Because you see, they could have just walked past the man just like everybody else did, just like the man had seen for his entire life. How many people had walked past alms, alms, and just left him sitting there? Maybe they tossed him a shekel or something with Caesar's engraving on it. But not only did they take the time to stop, and look at him and have compassion on him. And to speak a word of faith, there was enough love there that it says he stretched out his hand. He took him by the hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. Next verse. He was leaping up and stood and walked and entered into the temple and walking and leaping. Walk and leap. Walk and leap. That was like a frolic. <laughs> walking and leaping, he entered with them in the temple and he praised God. And all the people saw. And they knew that it was him that sat there for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. Simple story. Good Sunday school lesson. The thing is, though, is if you correlate that to me and Jesus, it's that same type of love. Each and every one of us sitting here tonight are lame because of sin. We're damaged we're hurt, 
We're broken. And thanks be to God that somebody had enough love to bring me into this place, a place where I could meet the one that could fix me, the one that I could meet, the one that could piece me back together and heal my body and mend me where I was broken and where I was hurting. You see, the spirit of Cain would have walked right past that man. Alms, alms, pow. Get out of my way. I got to go make prayer at the temple. That's the spirit of this world. That's the spirit that says, I don't care about my brother. I'm, I don't care about what condition he's in. When Bishop talks about the dimensions of living, dimensionally, that's a lot lower. That's second and third dimension living. God's calling for somebody to come up higher than that. God's calling for somebody to come up and break out of where they're at, beyond blessing and beyond just living in, in, in the goodness of God, but coming into a place where you recognize that there's needs of your brothers and sisters around you, and it's intentional. It's the way I think. Because love's grown in me, love has developed in me to the point to where I'm concerned about my brother and my sister. And just like that man at the gate called Beautiful, when he was healed, when he was touched by their compassion, by their love, by the power of God, he jumped and he leaped and he glorified God. What do you think is going to happen in your city? What kind of revival comes when you walk past somebody at Walmart that you see in a wheelchair and you say, such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And you go even farther and extend out your hand to see that miracle come to pass. What happens when you come up to pray for somebody when you can tell they're in the middle of a struggle and a trial? Yeah, I've got to get home. Yeah, I'm a little hungry. I want to go eat. But right now there's something more important. Somebody's hurting. Somebody's destitute. There's a city in the world out there that just relying on me and you to come to it and say, right now I'm here, and right now I'm ready, and right now I'll go. It's a message from the beginning. It's a message of love. That Jesus said, you know what? I know what this is going to take out of me, and if it be thy, my, thy will, let this cup pass me by. But if not, I'll endure it to the very end. I'll defeat death and I'll defeat sin and I'll take the keys to hell. Come play, please. I'm finished. Mark 12, 28 records this. They're trying to catch Jesus. They're trying to trip him up. It says that one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well. Imagine that. Jesus answered them well. Um, it's almost like he knew what they were going to ask. The scribe thinks, you know what? I'm smarter than the rest of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I've got the one question that's going to mess him up. Which commandment is the first of them all? Jesus answered the first of all the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The first foundational words he says to him is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now watch this. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The second is just like the first. You've got to love your brother with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, all of your strength, everything that's in you. Love your neighbor. You see, we love ourselves a lot. We're consumers. what I want, it's what I need, it's what I want to do, it's what I'm interested in. 
I, 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 I. Lots of eyes will get you broken in despair, hurt, lost, lonely. But when I shift my attention off of me and onto him, when I stop looking down at my situation and my problems and I lift up my head where my help comes from and I start trusting in Him and drawing closer to Him and understanding the love that He has for me and the love that I have for Him, it changes everything about my daily walk. It changes how I talk to you. It changes how I react to you. Why don't we all stand? The message that resounded in the garden that day has made it all the way to this Sunday night in 2022. And it's the same message that says, I'm open and I love you and I'm here for you and I will redeem you, I will call you, I will fix you, I will help you, I will carry you If you're fractured, if you're hurting, if you're broken, I want you to know that I love you and God loves you. And as a church body, this church loves you. And I'm not perfect and you're not perfect. And the fruit's still growing in us. We've got to try. It doesn't matter how much disagreement I have with you. It doesn't matter whether you thought the carpet should be green, gold, gray, black, or blue. It doesn't matter who got to do what or when they got to do it. Or who didn't get to do what. I still love you with everything that's in me. And I want to help you. I need you. That man at the gate needed John and Peter. As much as I need Jesus Christ right now, and as much as I need you right now, That message was a message of love. Why don't you make your way down to this altar? Everybody come. If you're able, come. I don't want to end on a somber note. I want to end on a note that there's hope here. I can't do this by myself. I can't do this separated. I can't do this walking through this world trying to figure it out on my own. I need my family. I need somebody that loves me. I need somebody that cares about me. Hey, because I'm going to mess up. I'm going to trip. I'm going to fall. I'm going to make a mess out of things. And my goodness, I've got to know that I can walk back in here and that you love me and you support me and you care about me and you're going to pick me back up and carry me again. As they sing tonight, why don't you lift your hands all over this place? The love of God's in here tonight. You need me. 
And if you've been struggling, if you've been going through it where you felt so separated, you felt like something was dividing you, I want you to pray for the love of God to come into your life tonight. Sometimes we forget to pray the simple prayer. God, I just want your love. Come on, he'll give it to you. He's not going to hold anything back. God, I need you tonight. that you've struggled. Why don't you find somebody to pray with? There's going to be breakthrough right now. There's going to be revival comes out of you loving your neighbor as yourself. Come on, it's the type of love that says, I don't care what's between us. I need your help. I've got to have your help. I can't do it alone. I'm tired of fighting by myself. I don't want to feel like somebody's fighting at my back or talking about me. Come on, somebody pray. God, I need your help tonight. Come on, the Holy Ghost is going to move in here just like it moved before. God's going to help somebody. Come on, church, pray. Pray. God loves you. Don't let the devil lie to you. God knows right where you're at. Come on, the Holy Ghost is moving right now. God loves you. God will carry you through the times when you can't do it on your own. helping somebody. God's going to break you out of that rut that you've been in, brother. God's going to set you free of what you've been going through, sister. Let's save our sins. 